Hello and welcome. Uh, today we have a, a special guest speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jack Koenig, a staff engineer at sci -Fis. Uh He's had an interesting career uh, spanning both uh, industry and academia and has quite a bit of experience in agile hardware design. This is why I was very excited to get Jack to speak. Uh, so he has an undergraduate degree uh, from University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree at, from UC Berkeley. He's seen a lot of different ways companies operate, having interned at ARM, Intel, I'm sure we forget some, Apple and Google, <laughs> and is currently employed by Sci-5. So you definitely have seen how many different companies, you know, make the sausage and do the hardware. And so it's really exciting to hear this talk. And I guess you'll tell us a little bit more about how to do open source hardware stuff at Sci-5 and in general. So take it away, Jack. Great, thank you, um, Professor Beamer, for the introduction. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I, uh, um, I'll note that uh, this is not a topic that I've ever given a talk on before, but I, you know, have realized that I've spent a lot of time doing, um, you know, open source hardware project management. So it was a good opportunity to kind of collect some of my thoughts into something that might be useful to someone else, I hope. Um, so yeah, um, I think, uh, I think he covered the introduction pretty well, but, you know, a lot of what I do, well, I have a, another slide where I'll talk introduce myself a little bit more, but so anyway, here's my talk on, as stated, open source hardware project management. Now, as I was writing this talk, I realized that, um, oh, I think I have to put it in the wrong spot, that this is kind of the same as just open source project management. There are definitely some differences that come up and hopefully I'll, I'll touch on some of them, but a lot of the stuff, a lot of the basics are the same. And with some of my time in industry working, you know, in you know still doing a lot of open source work but some closed source work as well i can say that it's also very similar to what you might just call project management or at least technical project management when it comes to how do you deal with uh how do you deal with writing software or designing hardware in any setting um so definitely the focus here is on open source but i just want to note that a lot of this is transferable so uh i think that there's valuable insights, I hope there's valuable insights to, um, to many of you wherever you end up and whatever you end up doing. Um, so, you know, to kind of add a little to Scott's introdu introduction, um, I started grad school in fall 2014, uh, which feels like yesterday, but seems to get further and further away uh, every passing day. Um, and that's when I met um, not yet Professor Beamer, although he was on his way to uh, to, you know, doing what you what you seem doing now. Um, and so when I started, I was using Chisel 2 in that first semester. And I know that you've taken a look at Chisel 3 throughout this semester and possibly in other classes. So hopefully uh, it's fairly familiar to you. Um, and then it was the next year that I was trying to use, so Chisel 3 and Fertile were brand new. Uh, we decided, well, the older grad students decided that we needed to kind of redo uh, the language and build a proper compiler because there's a lot of value that um, you can get out of having a you know well-defined IR that you can do custom transformations and things on. And I I assume that that um, Professor Beaver has covered that earlier in the semester, but it's a really useful concept to be able to write things against a uh, an intermediate representation. So anyway, I was trying to use Chisel 3 for a class and it was really, really bad <laughs> at the time. And so I started working on it out of necessity. Um, but I found out that I enjoyed working on it and I basically became a maintainer and I've been doing that um, more or less ever since. Uh, so then, you know, I started working at Sci-Fi part-time while in grad school and then full-time, I guess, three years ago now, where I do, I still work primarily on Chisel 3 and Fertile, um, although of course, occasionally other things, but those are my main tasks. Um, so I put my picture up there uh, because if you've ever been on the you know, the, ch the Chisel or Fertile GitHub or Gitter or Stack Overflow, you've probably seen me. I'm, I try to be fairly active there. So, um, you know, please feel free to come say hi, ask questions, whatever. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's a little bit more introduction about how I got involved in these projects. Um, I'll say that, you know, like I said, I wasn't originally trying to work on them, but I was originally trying to do, um, you know, simulation, uh, processor and SOC simulation. And so if you're familiar with the uh, FireSim project, uh, that was the kind of thing I uh, was trying to build and ended up, you know, mostly my colleagues did that while I was developing kind of the tools underneath. Um, okay, so, you know, what is this talk really about? Um, 
you know, I think I've always heard or been taught that, you know, a great talk has kind of a story and a theme that it goes throughout. And I couldn't come up with a great story, but this is kind of like the, the, the things that I've learned or things I wish I'd known when I kind of like stumbled into being a maintainer of a moderately sized open source project. I mean, you know, Chisel is nothing like the Linux kernel or LLVM, but, you know, we do have people chatting on Gitter every day, multiple times a day and uh, a fair number of users. So I think there's there's enough size that some of the things that you need as a project grows, um, you know, th these types of problems and how you solve them become apparent as your project grows. And so I've, I've done some of that. Um, so looking back at uh, lecture 20, um, Professor Beam recovered several things in, in somewhat detail that I that are very important that I probably uh, that I'm not going to cover much more, not because they're not important, but just because uh, I think he did a good job and um, there are other things that I want to highlight. But you know, these things are very important. Continuous integration, code management using version control like Git, uh, code review, and open source licensing. These are critical for an open source project. So don't take my not covering them in depth as a sign that they're not important. The little double negative there. They're important. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, I was trying to put together something about code review because I think that's actually, it's it's kind of an art, but um, I couldn't come up with a good way to present it. So uh, I'll just cover the things that I, I thought that I could do a better job of, but I'll refer you back to that lecture and uh, you know, please do uh, take a look at those things. So um, this is taken from lecture 20, kind of helped me start this talk, which are, you know, what are the ingredients for a successful open source project? Um, and I think that uh, th these are these are great ingredients. It needs to do something useful, right? I mean, I guess technically, uh, you know, an open source project doesn't need to do something useful, but if you want people to use it, you know, kind of, uh, uh, kind of obvious that it needs to do something that people want to use. Um, it obviously needs to work correctly. If things are broken, people won't use them. They try it, it doesn't work, they quit. That happens all the time. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that kind of concept later, but it's really important that you, you make things correct and that requires testing. Um, and I do wanna note that testing saves you time in the long run. Um, when, you know, when, you're, when you're writing something that you're gonna you know, do for a class, like thinking back to when I was an undergrad, if I were writing something for a class, I didn't really need that many tests because I wrote it, spent three or four days on it and then never looked at it again, right? But I've been maintaining the same code base for I guess going on six years now. And you can imagine that occasionally I touch code that's very old that maybe I wrote or maybe I didn't. And if there's not a test checking that functionality, it's incredibly hard to, uh, to you know, continue maintaining it, to you know, make a modification. Or if there's a bug in it and there's no test at all, it's really hard to figure out where to start. So testing is very important for the longevity of a project. Uh, documentation is extremely important and I'm going to touch on that a lot later. Um, um, because it's probably the most important thing in a project and probably the hardest thing to do well. It's something that everyone tries, everyone does, most people take very seriously, and yet it's still very hard to do. And I can speak from experience on that, um, uh, you, know, even, you know, with the chisel docs, which I think are, you know, decent, but could be much better. Um, publicity is obviously important. Um, if you want people to find it, it's good to be active, you know, somewhere. <laughs> Active at conferences is good. You know, giving lectures to classes is, is a good way to advertise things. Um, but um, it's you need to kind of go out into the world and, and find people to talk to and to present your work. Um, so conferences are, are the best, are the, the normal avenue for that, um, Twitter. And then of course, to be an open source project, it needs an open source license. And uh, I think Scott covered that pretty well, I think. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll leave that alone for now. But I want to add on that with what I would consider ingredients for, for successful open source project management. So um, some of that stuff is definitely related to management, but some things I want to add or reiterate are, you know, a huge part of project management is your technical collaboration, right? So when you're starting a project, if you only have one or two developers, it, may, it doesn't matter as much, and that's fine. Um, in fact, that's actually really nice. It's really nice to be in that early period of project exploration where you can do whatever you want and you can break things and nobody cares. Um, and that's wonderful. And you should, whenever you start a project, you should really embrace that time period. But once you start building something that other people are using or that other people want to develop, because, you know, you think 
you think you can do anything. I, I think like, oh, I have this feature idea and it will be done, you know, as soon as I get a moment and then two years go by <laughs> and finally the feature got in. But I can point to some pretty hilarious issues where it's like, oh, Jack is about to start working on this. And then I close the issue two years later. And it's just, that's sometimes what happens and you can't do everything on your own. And so collaboration is, is really important. Um, and so that involves, you know, code review and code review is so important to keep the quality of their code up because not only do you need to make sure it works, but also you're probably gonna have to maintain it. Or if you're not gonna have to maintain it, someone else is gonna have to maintain it. And so you hope that you can trust your collaborators that they will write good code, that someone else will check and review it so that if you have to go look at it, even though you are not involved in the code review later, you can fix a bug. And that's really important. And that happens all the time as a project grows. Uh, collaboration is important because sometimes you have to resolve technical disputes. I think a term I, that comes up a lot is bike shedding, which is kind of like uh, people arguing about things that don't matter, like the color of the bike shed is where the term comes from. That Those happen all the time. <laughs> and it's kind of like, should we call this function type of or get type? Should it be a function or a method? These are the little things that I think um, matter a lot. Like, they, they matter more than they should, but there are more complicated disputes than that, which is like longer term direction. Like what should the semantics of something be? Um, and those are, you know, these can be difficult questions and, uh, you know, you're all very smart and you're all probably right, but sometimes you're still going to lose. <laughs> and um, learning how to deal with those disputes and, and still collaborate successfully with people is, uh, is very difficult, but is like is critical in management of a project. And these all relate to managing large amounts of code over long periods of time. So I actually meant to do a line count of Chisel and Fertile and other projects I maintain and I forgot, but I believe at last count, we were looking at 40 to 50,000 lines of code, right? Uh, I don't remember who said this, but I've, I've heard over and over again that you can only keep 10,000 lines of code in your head at a time. Um, and I, I don't know what the number is, but it's definitely less than 50,000, <laughs> I can tell you that much that I actually keep very little of the code in my head at any given time at this point. And so this means that, you know, a lot of times when I'm adding a new feature or fixing a bug, I'm reading code that I've forgotten details about, a lot of details about. And so that's where having high quality code is really important. Um, you know, there are the obvious things like comments, but it's not just about comments. Um, a term I really like is, is to write, quote, self-documenting code and that really just means you try and write code as clearly as you can. You try and use, you write idiomatic code for the language that you're in that makes the thing it's doing as clear as possible. And that's hard, that this is what software engineering is all about. And this is what growing as a software engineer is about is figuring out how to do this. And um, I, I can even, I think I remember when I was watching over at lecture 20 that uh, Professor Beamer mentioned something about how you, you want to make sure that the code in the code base is all consistent and that it's not really obvious who wrote different sections, kind of like in a paper. Uh, and that's absolutely true. And I can say from experience that that was not always the true in my code bases. And I can see periods of my own growth as a software engineer where I went from like writing really bad code to figuring out how to write okay code, but then getting really excited about things, about features I shouldn't use. So for those of you who've learned more Scala, if you have started using things like folds, they are great for doing certain things, but don't fold everything. <laughs> and if you look at some of the old code in Fertile, you might find some really bizarre folds and they're probably my fault. Um, and that's not what you want, right? You want to write code that is as clear as possible. Okay, so related to that, that's all kind of the technical collaboration between the contributors, right? And how you keep saying yourself. But another piece that's, if you want your project to be adopted by anyone is, is documentation. And I tried to go for four C's and I only got three and a D, but we've got, you know, correct, current, comprehensive, and discoverable, right? So obviously your documentation needs to be right. And that sounds a lot easier than it is. It's actually really hard to keep your documentation correct. Uh, and I'll talk about some, some techniques later to help with that. But as you evolve your project, your documentation will be wrong. And it's, it's very hard for users because they, get, they come across old documentation. There's a lot of old chisel documentation out there. And it's problematic because it tells people to do the wrong thing. You need it to be current, right? So this is up to date. If you add new features, you want those documented. Uh, otherwise people don't use them and then they never learn all the cool things you've been doing. You need it to be comprehensive. Um, so you need to cover lots of different use cases and lots of different ways of, of, of doing things. Um, you know, it's, 
it's great to have a basic introduction to doing something and that's the most important piece. But then if when people do, when your users do start diving into the cooler stuff they can do with your tool or your library, uh, you need to have documentation to have continue guiding them. And it needs to be discoverable. Um, this is one that I think in the Chisel project we've struggled with a lot, especially because, you know, like search engines may rank the wrong <laughs> documentation and we need people to find the new documentation. And so you need to make sure that people can find it. And, um, and that's sometimes easier said than done. Um, sometimes it's not so bad. Okay, another piece that's important are releases. I'll talk more about that in a moment, um, but that's kind of just like showing, evolving your project over time. A big piece of it is community. Um, you know, I, 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 I like to think that we do a decent job of community in the Chisel project. You know, we have Stack Overflow for longer form questions. We have Gitter for shorter form questions. We have a mailing list for people who prefer that mechanism of communication. Uh, and then of course we have, you know, GitHub issues. There's a lot of different ways to communicate. And I think we, we try to be fairly active on them, but it, it can be hard. I sometimes, I've realized that my email gets overloaded and I miss issues on GitHub sometimes. And I go back and I realize it's been 16 days and I never answered a question. And that's, that's not great. Um, when you're trying to uh, build a community, responsiveness matters. And uh, it's, it's not something that's like, oh, all of a sudden you're good at being responsive. <laughs> it's like, it's like over time, I feel like I can feel myself go through periods of being super great and responsive and then not. And, you know, that's just, this is the long haul of a project and a long haul of people being involved in the project. And you want, you hope that other maintainers will contribute to the community as well. Uh, but, you know, the good news about that is that once you build at least some community and you have some more like advanced users, they often will pick up some of the slack. So I've noticed that on Gitter a lot. Uh, there was a period where I feel like I was the only one answering questions and all of a sudden a ton of people started answering questions and it's not, it makes it a lot easier to deal with when you're not the only one doing it. Um, and then kind of this, something I want to highlight because I tend to conflate these a lot and I'm going to conflate them throughout this talk. So I'm going to mention it while I'm thinking about it, um, is something to keep in mind is your policy versus your mechanism. So, uh, we're, you know, we're software engineers or hardware engineers or computer scientists, whatever term you want to use. And we like to write code. We like to automate things. We like to make things work. And that is important and useful. It is, it is useful to have mechanisms to enforce policies, but keep in mind that it doesn't always have to be that way. Not everything has to be tied to what you can like enforce, but if you can enforce it, that's usually a good idea. So I'm kind of contradicting myself a little bit, but the point is that like, for those who've used GitHub extensively, it has a lot of great tools for code review, right? It has tools like uh, suggesting changes that the, that the person who opened the PR can merge into their PR. It has the ability to require CI to pass, the ability to require a review to approve it or multiple reviews to approve it. And these are great tools that you should use as you grow a project. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be so rigid, um, especially early. Like you can have a policy of, um, you know, you must have a, uh, a you know thumbs up code review, but if it's a small PR that's a tiny bug fix, maybe you don't want to block it on on a on code review. Maybe it's not worth requiring a contributor to review something that fixes a typo, right? So it's really important, and and you don't want your mechanisms to pick up like if you have too strict of a mechanism, then it it makes it harder to do simpler policies. So it's kind of a balancing act there. Um, I don't have a lot more to talk about on that, but I just want to keep in mind that like I'm going to present here some some mechanisms and some policies and just like try and keep in your head that these these can be different. It doesn't sometimes you can enforce things with a tool and sometimes you don't need to. All right, so this is um, kind of echoing um, um, a slide or this is a slide that Professor Beamer presented in lecture 20. Um, but I'm going to kind of re reiterate it a bit. It's why should you open source your work? And he mentioned you can help the world. Uh, the community can help improve your code. It can raise your profile. And, you know, a, 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 a pretty reasonable argument, why not? 
And I want to add another one that's just, this is kind of related to raising your profile, but it's also just related to developing you as, a, as an engineer, which is there are transferable skills. So if you've heard about like what the higher, like what the, um, uh, what is it called? Like the, the hiring, the promotion path through engineering is that most companies you have engineer, senior engineer, staff engineer, senior staff engineer, principal engineer. Like what, what is the difference between a senior engineer and an engineer? or a junior engineer? Is it that they write better code? Well, hopefully, but more importantly, they have to do all the management stuff. They have to be the ones who make sure the documentation is current. Uh, they're the ones who make sure the CI isn't broken. Um, and so these skills that you get in managing an open source project are the kinds of things that, um, that you need in the workplace. Um, um, so there's a question about what about when should you release your work? Um, I'll I'll comment on that a bit in a minute, but that, that, that is a great question. Um, I should probably speed up slightly. So anyway, so what makes it a senior engineer senior is these types of skills that I'm, we're talking about. And what do engineering managers do? They do that, but even less of the technical stuff. They're just doing the documentation and just doing the, you know, the dealing with technical collaboration. So these skills are the kinds of things you need to advance in your career. Uh, that's kind of an interesting perspective, but it's similar in research. What do you think an advisor is mostly doing? They, they get to write some code, but a lot of the time is managing grad students code and, and presenting the projects. And presenting projects is a form of documentation. So it's these kinds of things are, are related to building a career or advancing in your career. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about releasing and versioning just to make sure part of it is to make sure you understand like what these concepts are. Uh, you probably have a good idea, but it's good to go over. Um, so here's the most recent release on Chisel. Um, and, you know, like if we look at what this is, it really is just kind of like uh, this is the GitHub UI, which I think is really useful. Let me maybe turn on the laser pointer, uh, which I think is useful. Uh, but what is a release? I mean, it's it's a git tag, which is just a marker on a git commit, but it's a number, a name and number uh, that I've assigned to it, which is 3.4.3 .3 is the version number, and it's some release notes. Um, so that's kind of the basic idea of what a release is. Uh, so it's we've taken the project at a point in time, assigned a name to it, and associated some documentation with it, which is that that the release notes, the change from the previous version, which is really useful for your users to see what's new, right? Um, and so, like I said, it's a checkpoint in time. It provides it, documentation of progress since the previous release. It also usually includes some form of distribution, which is maybe a published binary so that your users don't have to build your project from source if it's a, a pro, you know, in a language that requires compilation. Um, you may push your code or your binary to a package repository like Maven Central, which is where we publish Chisel for and related projects, or PyPy if you're writing Python, or NPM if it's JavaScript, or you know a Linux distribution package if it's something that you know should go to Ubuntu or Debian, right? So a release is kind of just like a packaging up of the project, um, and um, a version very related to a release is basically kind of a number or name associated with the software at a given point in time. It's really useful as for organizing your project because it allows you to kind of like, you know, show progress over time for features and, you know, bug fixes and stuff. Some people, including, uh, you know, rocket ship, <laughs> use commit hashes as their form of versioning, but really that's not, that's not a good way to do it. It's really hard for users to reason about it, there's no like what's nice in a version number is there's meaning and a commit, a commit hash has no meaning. So commit hashes are a form of versioning, but only really they should only be used by developers. They're useful if you're, you know, communicating with your collaborators and they shouldn't really be used other than that. Um, version numbers provide stability, you know, when you you're like putting a stake in the ground that this version 3.4.2 will always be 3.4.2. It helps users report bugs and helps developers find them. If someone files a bug, it's critical to know what version they're using, right? And if, if your versions are this continuous line of things, it can make it really hard to pinpoint where they are. And it's like, oh, that's three years old. Like, you know, maybe you should update. Um, and they're used to convey information about a release. So this is that semantic information in the number. So 
you know, when you increment some numbers, it may mean you probably just fix bugs. When you increment other numbers, it may mean you have breaking changes or exciting new features or both. And so that meaning is useful to your users and helps them see like, yeah, when Chisel 3.4.3 comes out, it's like, eh, it's some bug fixes I should update at some point, but it's not a big deal. But when 3.5 comes out, like that's something I should look at, right? That's the kind of thing you're communicating. And so I mentioned semantic meaning of these numbers, and I think that this is really important. Um, so I'm going to talk about a specific form of semantic versioning called Simver, which uses three digits. There's major dot minor dot patch. Uh, and the, this is a defined standard, and I have a link to it there, where uh, patch is small changes or bug fixes that don't affect the API. Minor releases are things that are backwards compatible API features, and major are backwards incompatible changes. So that's actually not what Chisel uses. Um, I think we've had versioning since before any of us knew what Simver was. <laughs> uh, we use something similar, though. I would still say our versioning is semantic. It's just not capital S Simver, uh, where we use epoch, which basically means ignore the first number. <laughs> it's always three for Chisel 3. Uh, and then we have dot major dot minor. And our major meaning is the same. There may be backwards incompatible changes, and the minor can include patches as well. So any any non backwards incompatible changes or bug fixes come in the minor versions. Um, and this is described on the Chisel website. I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, and so I can show some versions that we've released this year or in the last year. Um, and you'll note here that we have, so I mentioned that the second number is major. So 3.2, 3.3, and 3.4 are three major version lines. And one thing you may notice is that we actually have overlapping version. So we released 3.2.6 and then 3.3.1 and then 3.2.7, right? Or 3.2.8 came after 3.4.1. And so this overlapping is something that is, you know, useful in a, in a, in a more mature project. But I, you know, recall from lecture 20, Professor Beamer said that, you know, with your like version control, you should really try to maintain as few branches as possible. And this kind of thing requires lots of stable branches. So I'm going to not recommend doing this unless you really need to. I'm going to talk about how we do this. And it's not as bad as it sounds. But you know, don't do this. <laughs> don't start by trying to do this. Just if, as soon as you make a breaking change, increment your major number, and then go from there. And it's fine. Um, but this does highlight something that's pretty important to keep in mind in a project as it matures, which is source versus binary compatibility. If a backwards incompatible change requires bumping a major version, then you need to know what's backwards incompatible, right? Now, source compatibility is usually obvious. Like, you know, if you have a public function and you change the type of one of the arguments or you add an argument and there's no version without that argument, you've broken the, the source uh, API. But you really need tests to check that. And, and tests are an important like check of your source compatibility because they're compiled every time. However, another thing to keep in mind is, is something called binary compatibility. And this only matters in compiled languages. So you know, this doesn't matter in Python, for example. But it does matter in Scala. It matters a lot to Chisel, so I'm going to explain it. Um, and this is, this is whenever you publish some type of compiled thing. So a jar in Java is what we publish to Maven. Um, it's really important. And there are tools to check it. So um, why is binary compatibility so important? So if you have, if there's some cool library you like, and it's compiled against Chisel version 3.2, and you want to depend on that library, but you're using Chisel 3.4, because we break binary compatibility on major versions, this will not work. And that's, A, that's not great. <laughs> you don't like the fact that your libraries have to be on similar versions of the thing to, to you, right? That this does annoy users of Chisel off and on, where we have to go ask my cool library to update. But that's what binary compatibility is. And it's unfortunate. It means that you know if there's something published a long time ago, you'd like to use it, but it has to be recompiled and republished for you to use it because you're on a newer version. So we do maintain binary compatibility, and we check it for minor versions. So if that cool library were published against 3.4.0, and you're using 3.4.3, that's fine. And so that's what binary compatibility is all about. And so I'm not going to tell you to worry too much about this when you first start a project. I think, you know, when you first start, feel like break things, <laughs> move fast, break things. But if you, once you do start having users, this starts to get really important because binary compatibility issues are really frustrating when someone tries to use a library, they're using a library, they bump their version of your project and now things don't work. And they're like, why is this happening? And it's happening because of this kind of dependency thing where you both have a common dependency and your versions of it are not binary compatible. 
Um, so, uh, you know, some tips about this, I've said over and over again, don't like, don't panic, uh, make everything you can private once you start trying to care about your API, but really start simple. I think versioning is useful. It's useful to start early, but, um, you know, to answer the question from earlier, you know, is when should you release your work too early, maybe buggy and not easy to use too late. And it's, you know, it's, it, you know, pe people may have like moved on from your project or something. Um, that that's difficult to choose. I would say, you know, you don't need to do large scale distribution. Like if you're doing a chisel project, you don't need to figure out how to push it to Maven until you have people who are willing to build it from source and use it. So your releases don't need to be anything crazy, but you can do a release on GitHub. You can say, I've made five commits. I'm calling this 0.1.0. And, you know, the, the, the pro of that is that you get process early and it shows the evolution of the project. The con is maybe it's too early and someone's like, ah, it has a version, I'm gonna try it and it doesn't work. I, you know, I don't have a great answer other than, um, you know, when you put, if you start with a zero point in front of it, that usually tells people to be careful. <laughs> Make sure your readme says this is under active development. Um, anyway, um, I guess what I'm trying to say here is there can be a lot of discipline in your versioning and we have a lot of discipline in Chisel, but you don't need that until you have users anyway. So start simple. Uh, look at how other projects do it. There's tons of projects on GitHub that do releases. And I talked about overlapping releases for Chisel. Don't do that uh, unless you really need to. And if you think you need to, you probably don't think again, and then maybe you should do it um, when your project gets pretty large. All right. Um, so now I'm going to move on and really talk a lot about documentation because this is something that I think I have done personally done a bad job of for a long time and something that I think is, you know, it's just incredibly important. So I said earlier, it's probably the most important piece for a successful project. And let me explain why. It saves effort for both the user and the developer. So the user figures out the right way to do something more quickly, right? Instead of someone coming to your project and banging their head against the wall, not like they're like, I like the description you have here. I can kind of use it, but I can't figure out how to do this thing. Um, it saves them a lot of time if you have good documentation. Um, it also means you spend a lot less time answering questions. So there are questions I've answered, I don't know, tens of times. And it's like, we don't have a doc for it. And that's just like, not okay. Because if we had a doc, answering the question would be instant. I just send a link to the doc, right? And ideally, few, fewer people would ask the question because they'd come across the doc on their own. So that's why it's so important for saving effort. But it's really, I have found it hard to write great documentation. And so there's this methodology that a coworker came across that I think is really good. It's a really good way to frame documentation writing. It's something we've started using in Chisel and I we need to use more, in my opinion. But it makes it easier, it makes your documentation more useful, it makes it easier to write. Uh, the easier to write is a big one because I find it hard to sit down and write documentation. So having a way to frame my thinking such that it's easier to accomplish my documentation writing is extremely helpful for me. So this is you know, shamelessly stolen or borrowed with love depending on your perspective from uh, this company called Divio. And I have a link here. I strongly recommend taking a look at it when you need to write docs for a project. So. They separate documentation into four types. You have tutorials, how-to guides, explanation, and reference. And I'm gonna talk about each of these different types here in a moment, and then talk about how I think you should apply them. Um, but this little, you know, this like four, like four corners is done this way because tutorial, there are relationships between each adjacent type. So tutorials are similar to how-to guides in that they tend to be steps right? Like you, a tutorial is do this, 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 a how-to guide is do this, this, this. An explanation, which is like a long form description of maybe your mindset or, a, you know, a model is about understanding. This is like really about, uh, well, I, I should talk more about that in a minute, but tutorials and explanation are for when you're kind of studying, whereas how-to guides and reference are for when you're working. So if I'm like, how do I make a state machine in Chisel? Or what is the API for Reginit in Chisel, right? These are kind of related. Um, in that sense. So, uh, you know, they, all of this is on their website. I recommend taking a look. I'm going to talk a bit more about each, about each topic, uh, just to really highlight, uh, what I think is useful here. So tutorial is about learning by doing, 
it's really important for getting your users started. And I think they're by far the most important thing because when someone comes and finds your project, I'm going to call them a learner down here. There's someone who's, who's not a user, right? They just saw it and they're like, maybe I should try this out. If they cannot get something working very quickly, they will not use your project, period. And this has been a problem for a long time with Chisel because, you know, it's like it was, you could set it up, but unless you had a little bit of extra help, it was really hard and people would just, you know, say, I can't figure it out. Um, my current two level manager, so my manager's manager told me that he tried it years ago and couldn't get it working and he gave up. And then he didn't try it again until he started working at Sci5. And that's, that's not great. You don't want it to be difficult. It's critical that your tutorial is easy to use for people coming into the project and they must work. There's nothing more frustrating than trying out a tutorial, running the command and, not, and it doesn't work, right? That's the kind of thing that makes people give up on the project. So how do you make sure your documentation works? Can you have continuous immigration, continuous integration for your documentation? We'll come back to that. Um, but keep in mind that it needs to work and that it needs to work on different user systems. This is really difficult because it means that you want your stuff to work on a computer that you may not have, right? I don't have a Windows machine, um, but we need to make sure that things work on Windows. And this is the kind of thing that when you want to, when you want to build a truly successful project, you have to think about. Do you need that from day one? No, but that's the kind of thing that as you grow as a project, you need to work on. Um, and so a good example of this is just like, how do I generate Verilog with Chisel? And um, I think all of you are probably familiar with the Chisel Bootcamp, which is our tutorial. And you know, it is tested because, because it is using Jupyter Notebooks. It's tested because you can run a Jupyter Notebook in CI. So that's one way of doing CI for your documentation. Um, we are able to at least see that these code blocks run. And that's pretty important, <laughs> right? So this is an example of a tutorial. Uh, also, we do Jupyter Notebook because it's easier to set up. Whereas setting up a Chisel project may involve installing a couple more dependencies, you can launch the Chisel Bootcamp in your browser and not have to install anything. So that's like the goal of making it really easy to use. Um, so how-to guides are important as well, but they're very and they're similar to the tutorials, but they're very goal-oriented. Whereas a tutorial is for a beginner, a how-to guide, which people sometimes still call tutorials, but it's nice to kind of separate the notions, are like something that you know you would only think about once you've been using the project for a while. So they're more about, you know, concrete steps to accomplish the goal. Uh, and they're trying to explain exactly what to do. So th these, I find some of the easiest ones to write because you just find a question someone's asked you and then you write how to do it. So it's like, how do I create an optional port, right? That is like a thing. And that's a good example of a simple how-to guide. Um, so, you know, here's an example from the Chisel website. How do I create an optional IO? And you know, maybe this isn't the best because it's not a whole bunch of steps. It's just an example, but at least the mindset of how do I do this? Here's how you do it. That's what a how-to guide is. Uh, there's not a lot of like theory here. There's not a lot of explanation. There's just a basic example. So explanation is for understanding or is more understanding oriented. And this is really important for when you want someone, usually when they're a moderate to advanced user and you want to help them understand some of the ideas behind it, this is why, you know, when someone says like, why should I use Chisel over Verilog, right? That's an explanation kind of thing because it's not really a tutorial. It's not really a how-to. It's really kind of theoretical and kind of, it's very opinion oriented, but also you do want to justify yourself, of course, but you, it's, you can provide background context. You can provide a mental model. You can talk about the concepts of hardware design and why, you know, why using an embedded DSL like Chisel allows you to do things you couldn't do in Verilog. Right. Or at least maybe makes you more productive to do the same things you would do in Verilog. And so uh, these are really good for, um, you know, the, 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 the real understanding and appreciation for the thought that goes into your project. It's like, why is my database library better than every other database library kind of thing. Um, and so a good example of this is Chisel signal naming plugin. So we, we name the signals and this is actually pretty sophisticated how this works and like that's not useful to new users. I'm showing this slide here and I don't know, you know, how experienced all of you are in Chisel, but this probably doesn't matter <laughs> to most of you. But if it did matter, it's good to be able to dig into why and understand exactly what's happening under the hood. And what's happening is we're taking your, your Scala code and we're rewriting it in, a, in, a, in the compiler. Um, but like I said, most of the time that doesn't matter. 
And then the last kind of documentation, and this is one you're certainly familiar with, is reference. This is very information oriented. It, sh it should just be the exact details to the point. Um, and almost always, this is machine generated. Um, this is like your API docs, your Scala doc. Now, it's not entirely machine generated. You do usually want to have some additional information about pitfalls, like you know, in Scala doc, in those comments, we can like write some text. That's useful. That part's obviously not machine generated. That's you know human written. But the actual like API doc, right? Like this page is generated from the fact that we have this class called UN, right? I didn't write this. Uh, and it includes all the functions that you can call on it, including their types. And then of course, you know, this module operator, that wasn't generated, we wrote that, but you know, this is the module operator, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, so I just presented that and you're probably saying that sounds like a lot of work. I thought that we're, you're trying to encourage us to do open source and now you're telling me I have to write all this documentation. And the answer is like, kind of. So you don't need all of this from day one. You're definitely not gonna have this when you're just starting a project. But the point of this documentation system is that I find it makes writing documentation easier. And someday, as soon as you have users or you're trying to gain users, you're gonna need to write documentation. And this, I find, makes it easier to write. All I'm gonna say is like from day one, you should include something. Describe in your readme what your project does and include a tutorial. Tell people how to run something. Hello world, right? Like at least something. And that's enough to start. That will get that will get you your first issue filed on GitHub, which is how do I do X? But you're never gonna get how do I do X if you don't have a simple tutorial. So my only advice is write at least one tutorial and then you can save the rest for as your project gets more complicated. A nice note I wanna add is if your project is simple, you don't need a lot of documentation. So when you build something large, like a language, you end up needing a lot. But if you do something simple, one of my favorite projects, see if I can click on it, and that is working, is WaveDrum. Some of you probably use this. Oh, sorry, it's not showing up. There we go. No? All right, that's, I have to close this. Okay, there we go. So WaveDrum is, a, is my screen so sharing? Can you see this? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So WaveDrum is a great project for digital diagrams. And what I like about it is that it's extremely simple. <laughs> you can look, there's a tutorial. I mentioned a tutorial is very important, right? Here's some very basic stuff you can do. There's an editor. And the editor you know, allows you to play with it and generate wave diagrams. If you haven't used this for your classes, you should. Uh, this is a very simple project, a very simple API. It doesn't need a lot of documentation because it doesn't do too much. It does. A, one thing very well. And so this is a good example of like that. I talked about a lot of different kinds of documentation, but maybe if you build something simple enough, you don't need as much of it. So that's just a little shout out to, um, you know, making smaller projects can be very useful. Okay, so now I talked about kind of CI for your um, project. And this is comes from a concept called literary programming. And I definitely need to speed up here. So we have what? 15 more minutes. Is that right? Approximately. We can go a little bit over for questions. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll but I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. So literate programming is, is a concept of writing, you know, a mix of documentation with explanation so that your your code, your your documentation is actually run and checked. It's a really good way to check that your documentation is is current, which I referred to earlier. It's not the same thing as API documentation. It's also not the same thing as writing comments in your code. Uh, but this is really great for tutorials because it makes sure your tutorial works. So one way of doing this is, I already showed this, Jupyter Notebooks, right? You're, I know you're familiar with this. You've used them in this class. Um, these are a great thing for tutorials. <laughs> there's a reason why they're getting so popular. Um, um, but there's other ways to do it. There's this tool I really like in Scala called MDoc, which is type checked markdown documentation. And so this, what this lets us do is we write doc markdown, but it's actually compiled and run. And so I do want to be quick with my example here, but I want to show something pretty neat, I think. Let's see if I can open this. I cannot open the link. Um, so there's one. So this right here is, is, is the Chisel web page, right? And it has, you know, this is clearly generated from Markdown, as I know you saw in class. 
But you'll notice here that this has some Scala and then this has some Verilog, right? And you can, of course, write this in Markdown. You can write the Scala, you can write the, the Verilog. But what happens if something changes in the way the Verilog generation changes uh, over time in your project? So, oops. So what we do is we use this tool called um, MDoc. And if you look here, you know, this is the same stuff, the same exact uh, page, but you'll notice here that instead it actually has some, some Scala code here. And if you look at the raw markdown, what we're actually doing is using these identifiers. So this MDoc one makes sure that this code is compiled and run. This MDoc Verilog one is actually a custom one that I wrote to hook into that tool where it's going to run, it's going to compile this and run this and take the output and wrap it in Verilog ticks. So this code stays up to date with Chisel as Chisel evolves. And I think that's a really cool, like we had a huge problem for a long period of time where the Chisel documentation was always out of date. And this tool has made it to where our documentation stays up to date. So great tool in Scala. It, these exist in some other languages, check them out. Um, so tips for great documentation, you know, literate programming is a useful tool. It's not a silver bullet. Um, it's hard. I don't have good literate programming tools for everything. I don't have a good one for, I, for project setup. I wish I had like something for like running installation. Uh, I've joked that we have mdoc, but we need mdocker where I can write like bash instructions and it will run it in a Docker container and make sure it at least works on some version of Linux. Uh, but I would also like that for Mac OS and Windows. And you know, we don't have that as far as I know. But one big tip is that you want to keep to keep your documentation current incorrect is you want to empower your users to fix it. So you want to make it as easy as possible to submit patches to update your documentation. Um, so related to a lot of this is, is automation. And so uh, I, there's a couple XKCDs I love about this, which is it worth the time? You know, how much time are you shaving off from a task you do all the time? Should you write a program to do it, basically? Uh, and then when you've decided that you're going to automate something, what actually happens? And uh, you think you're going to save a whole bunch of time, and then you end up spending a lot of time working on the, uh, you know, you spend all your time like debugging and rethinking your automation program. So I'm going to contest with this view of the world. This does happen, and this should not happen. <laughs> and it shouldn't happen because you should approach your automation with the same rigor you do your regular software. This is something that I didn't do for a very long time and has really changed the way that I maintain projects. Because if you have bad automation, if your CI is always broken, if your publishing is always broken, if you're always if you're pushing releases, if your documentation generation is always broken, then you spend all your time fixing it. And you you spend your time ignoring it and then finally fixing it when you have to. And it is always really annoying. So my point here is that you should, you know, the way you write your code is with software engineering principles of trying to write good code, and you should do the same thing with your automation. Um, you know. Python is really common. Even if you are writing your project in some other language, people, many people use Python to write scripts. So I'm going to suggest if you do that, try things like MyPy for type checking. Add a little bit of safety so that when you read your Python code later, you can remember what it did. Because one of my least favorite things is when I take my old Python script and I change it slightly, and it turns out I forgot what the type of the thing I was passing. It was a, a dictionary of dictionary of dictionaries and not just a dictionary of lists or something. You know, it's like something is wrong. And it just crashes in weird ways. And code formatting is another useful tool to look at that I'm going to gloss over. You could try scripting in a typed language. So there's this tool, this project called Ammonite, which makes it possible to write Scala scripts, which if you happen to like Scala like I do, that's how I write my scripts these days. And it's great. My scripts are compiled and checked, and they work. Um, and another good tip is to use other people's code. There are a lot of automation tools out there. Mergeify is one that we take, make extensive use of in our projects for uh, maintaining branches for long term. GitHub Actions for CI and also for other things is really useful. And then Dependabot is another one that I'll touch on really quickly. Um, so I mentioned how Chisel maintains multiple stable versions at once. And I said that you shouldn't do this initially, but it's actually not as bad as you think. And the, and the way the reason that is is because of all this automation. So what we do is every time we do a major release, um, we create. So when we did 3.3, we we tag 3.3.0, and that's now a long lived branch called 3.3.x. Whenever we release 3.4, we tag 3.4.0, and then we started 3.4.x. And the point is that we don't ever make changes to these branches directly. All changes go to master or to a development branch. 
And then we use automation to backport changes. So if I have a bug fix that affects 3.3, then I can automatically have a backport created and merged to make sure that that change happens not only on master, but also on that stable branch. And so this process allows us to maintain multiple versions at the same time with relatively little effort. It's not zero effort. If it were zero effort, I'd say everyone should do it, but it's much lower effort than it was before we did automation. We used to have an engineer at Berkeley doing this work as his job. And it was a lot of work along with many other things, but he spent a lot of time doing this. And over time we managed to slowly automate it. And now it tends to work pretty well. Um, looking at time, I had an example, but I'm going to kind of gloss over these. I mentioned this basically, you open a PR, CI runs, it gets approved and marked for backporting. A bot called Mergeify will backport the PR. CI will run again on, the, on that branch. If that passes, it will be merged. So all of that happens. And all we did was one code review. And it's really cool when that works. I want to note we have a similar thing for the website um, where every night the website checks to see if the documentation on the different repos has been updated. If it has, then those PRs get made automatically. If they pass CI, they get merged automatically. If that happens, then master is pushed and CI runs again, just as a final check. And then if that passes, the website is pushed. And so if you make a documentation PR to chisel, I'll review it. I'll mark it for backporting to the stable branch because that's where documentation is currently hosted from. And then multiple bots will handle this process of taking that change from your one PR to being hosted on the website, but it's all done automatically. Um, so I would normally spend more time on that, but I'm running a bit low. So another important concept is governance. As your project grows and matures, you need to formalize your processes. Uh, this is something that only matters when your project gets big. So don't worry about this right now. <laughs> but if you do ever get to the point where you have lots of users, and you want this project to, you know, maybe someday you lose interest in it and you want this project to continue and people rely on it. That's when you need to formalize your governance process and you need to figure out what are the policies for getting new maintainers. Um, and you need, you, you know, you probably want help. Um, that's a really big thing is that this is hard to do on your own, but there are organizations that will help you with this process. And so just to call a few out, Apache is a very popular one. Um, Chisel and Fertile, you may have seen, are part of Chips Alliance, which is under the Linux Foundation. That's been really great for helping us with this process. And then another one that I think is good for hardware-specific projects is Fozzy, the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. So talk to them as well. Um, but again, this is something much further down the line. Um, usually, once you have a stable project, you've been doing releases, and you just need to figure out how to maintain it longer term. And you know, what are the benefits of Governance is, you know, we our conferences are hosted by Chips Alliance now, and that's great. Like, it's so much like I don't have to do a lot of work to host a conference. You know, we get to stick with the technical things like maybe figuring out what talks are going to be accepted and what the schedule is going to be. But I don't have to call a vendor to host it. I don't have to call a vendor to, to provide food. I don't have to figure out where the money is coming from. Right. These are things that come from joining a larger organization to help you with governance. So this is the kind of thing you do when you get larger. But it's pretty nice because it allows you to host your own conference instead of just going to other people's conferences to talk. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and so with that, I'll go to questions. Um, yeah, I ran a little longer than I meant to, but we still have a few minutes. Thanks for a great talk, Jack. Let's do some questions. Um, I guess you can see the chat, so I'm gonna let you uh, choose those as you go. Yeah, so, um, so we have a question from Jason. How often are APIs broken during updates? In the spirit of agile development, I'm constantly revising my code base. If I spend a lot of time solidifying interfaces, then I'm not coding. That is true. <laughs> Do you have advice for handling this trade-off? Assuming the code base matures, there will be less major changes. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that, that assumption is correct. I think, so agile design is great. It's what this class is about. It's really, it's really nice to be able to um, you know, develop quickly and ship things. And so a big part of you know, API stability, so I'm gonna provide a little trick here that is, it's, it's not just a trick, it's an approach to thinking about your APIs is um, you have to define what your interface is. So you know, if you are building something like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, let's say you're building something in Chisel, and let's say it's a tiling widget, like, I don't know, a DMA engine, okay? And you want to develop really fast, right? 
one API here that you're, you might be breaking all the time is your Scala APIs. But maybe that doesn't matter because maybe the only piece of your API that matters is the fact that it's a tiling interface. And if that tiling interface stays the same, and if your register map stays the same, so that software can still access your DMA, then who cares if you break the internal APIs of your module? So it's really important to define what your API is, because if you find yourself breaking it all the time, it could be that you, know, you just shouldn't solidify it yet and just say, sorry, people, I'm going to break this every month, every week, every day, whatever. Or maybe it should be you should think about redefining what interface you will be committed to maintaining. Um, so that's kind of like a, a way of, of helping here. It's, it's really important to figure out what APIs are worth maintaining and just maintain fewer if, if you need to. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that luxury and chisel everything's an API, so we have to be really careful, but you have that luxury, so take advantage of it. Uh, I have a question while someone else is thinking. Um, I thought the automated backporting was pretty neat. Um, I don't think I'm familiar with that technology. Uh, does that ever go wrong or you ever do change your code in ways to make that process more smooth? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question and that is, it absolutely does happen. So I'll just pull up my example, actually. Um, so here is a PR. Well, this one won't show it going wrong, but this will show the point. So here is a PR and kind of how we do it is we, we use labels. So this please merge label tells the bot to do the merging and this backported label is something that the bot puts on there to tell us it succeeded. Sometimes it doesn't succeed. That's pretty rare, but there are bugs in the automation tool and sometimes that never shows up. That's a good hint that something went wrong. Um, but uh, you know what the bot does is really cool. We use Mergeify. They have great documentation, by the way. So check it out. Lots of good examples. Very cookbook and tutorial oriented, and I think those are very important. Um, but you know it will. Not only do we have it merge the commit. Um, this isn't that important, but it's nice. But it also will open up the backport PR, right? So this open this PR. When it opened the PR, it put on a label. It waited for CI to pass and then it merged it, right? So how can things go wrong? Well, a pretty simple example of this going wrong is on Fertile where you can easily get backport conflicts. So let me show you a bad example of doing what I'm talking about here. So there's a whole bunch of open PRs on Fertile where we created a backport, but there's a code conflict because the code changed too much, right? And this is where I said, I said the cost is low, but it's very much not zero because if you want these to get merged, you have to go fix them, <laughs> right? Now, some of that can be, sometimes you just say, who cares, right? Maybe it's an old enough version that maybe instead of bothering with the backport, I'm just gonna close it. And that's probably what we should do for a bunch of these, just close them. Some of these are bug fixes that we would really like to get merged though. So that's why we kind of leave them open, even though I would argue that's bad practice. <laughs> but anyway, it does go wrong and if you look at some of these that were merged, um, sometimes we have to, if I can show an example of fixing it. You know, this one had some conflict. Uh, someone came in, rebased it, like cleaned up the conflict, and then, or it failed CI actually, and then they fixed it and then it, it merged. So anyway, yes, it does go wrong sometimes. Uh, question, how do you feel about Simver after using it for a long time? In my experience, the minor version can end up growing pretty quickly if you actually increment it every time you add a feature. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Um, and, you know, if you ask the Simver purists, they'll say, who cares? It's, I think there's a bit of a human nature. So minor version enough, but imagine major version, right? Imagine if you, if you are breaking APIs a lot and you go from version one to version 52 in a year, right? Um, you know, some people like, I, I, I do feel as a person that that feels weird. And so I, I, I totally share this, like, I don't know, it feels strange to me, but you know, at the same time, what's really nice about it is that version number tells someone a lot of information. Um, and so, you know, the, the minor version may end up growing very quickly, but if you're very strict with your Simver and, and you do mean just the minor version, 
then your users should know that if they were using 1.1, that 1.42 still works for them. So that's kind of cool. And so um, it rather than, you know, because an alternative approach would be, okay, let's group all these changes into another major version. And so instead of going from 1.1 to 1.42, you went from 1.1 to 2.0, but that 2.0 now says to someone, maybe my stuff doesn't work anymore. And so I think uh, if the version number grows too quickly, um, you know, you could consider grouping the changes together or it's just about changing your mindset and, and embracing it. It's kind of, Simver has been uh, a weird thing for me and we don't use pure Simver in Chisel and we also do slower versions. So maybe my answer is that I don't do, I don't practice what I preach entirely. <laughs> Uh, one question, which maybe you can decide how fully to answer. So uh, this term, we've been had students, you know, coding a lot with uh, Chisel 343. Do you maybe want to mention anything coming down the pipe that's exciting for 3.5 or beyond? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I really wish I had, uh, I thought about making some extra slides of this cool feature I'm working on, but I didn't. Um, but some things are small. Um, one is uh, if you, I, I showed an example earlier of bundle literals. Let me see if I still have it open somewhere. Um, I can just go to the website. So bundle literals are a cool feature, right? And I don't know if any of you have used them, but... Um, we, we have some in our test cases. I think you're definitely eager for how this is gonna evolve. Excellent. So we have added vector literals or vec literals because those were obviously missing. And so now you can have vecs of bundles of vecs. Um, there's still more improvement needed. Yeah, woohoo, agreed, <laughs> finally. Um, there's still more needed. I think we like still annoyingly as you went doesn't work on a literal and that's just a, my bad. If someone wants to help with that, I'm happy to advise, but um, I also, I should just do it. Um, but that's one thing that's really neat. Another one that I'm pretty excited about is Scala 213 support. So um, for those who are less familiar with Scala, they similarly to Chisel <laughs> break binary compatibility on their minor versions. So Scala 2.12 code is not binary compatible with Scala 2.13 code. Uh, but Scala 2.13, you know, we're on kind of an old version of Scala at this point. And 2.13 adds a lot of great features. It's a lot faster. It's like, I think Fertile runs 25% faster, despite the fact that some of the data structures say it should run slower, but it actually just runs a lot faster. So that's pretty cool. Um, so, and there's a lot of new APIs that I really like in Scala 2.13. Um, so that's exciting. Um, another feature that I'm working on is something called data view. And this one is kind of a more advanced feature in that, like, if you don't know why, like, it's one of these features where it won't matter to most people, but under the hood, it's really powerful. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I'm still cleaning it up a little bit, but what data view lets you do, maybe like diving into the code is not the right answer here. Um, but what data view lets you do is provi provide, if you're familiar with like unions, um, untagged unions and things like system Verilog or in C where you can have two types share the same underlying bits. This is a more powerful version of that. So you can have two bundles here and I can provide a mapping between them. And now in my code, if I ever have a bundle A, I can view it as if it were a bundle B and then do a connection. So this sounds similar to a cast, because in this case, you could do the same thing with a cast, but it's it works for the other side too, which a cast does not. So if I have this bundle that I can view as a different type, so I have a bundle B that I can view as a bundle A, then I can do that view and then connect to bundle A. So that's the basics of it. And that may not sound super exciting, but there's a lot of really cool things that fall out of this. And I need to write up the docs for it. I would have shown you the docs if they were written. Um, but it lets you, um, it lets you, a, a common complaint we have, if you've ever had to use Axi, you'll know that Axi is a very flat interface. Your ready and valids are at the same level as your payload. And so you'll have like ready, valid, address, data, write, enable, like all these things. And it's just like, it's not structured. In Chisel, we prefer to use decoupleds, right? And we like to have our payload as a type and then wrap it in a decoupled. So what this lets you do is present a mapping between the two so that 
on your interfaces, if you're interfacing with a Ver with Verilog, you can have that flat axis that is ugly, but in your chisel, you can use the prettier type and it will just work. So that's another use case. It allows you to view child bundles as parent types. So there's a lot of things that come out of this. Um, it's probably a lot less exciting to most of you than it is to me, <laughs> but uh, this is one of the features I'm, I'm most excited about in a long time. Ah, we have a raised hand. Hi, yeah. Um, you mentioned um, that you're have that you're adding like the the bundle or uh, support or the the unions uh, stuff like that. Um, I've, I've, isn't that also a feature in Scala three? Um, obviously, since you just switched to Scala two thirteen, switching to Scala three will be a huge undertaking. Um, but it seems like perhaps some of those features would be eventually. Um, you you don't have a need for a, like a, a chisel level feature. You can replace it with a Scala feature. Does that make sense? It does. So sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's some. It's kind of subtle. Uh, why it sometimes doesn't work, but. One of the things to keep in mind, this is this is this would be a good long form explanation in the chisel docs is like thinking about like what chisel actually does, like how it actually works. Um, and keep in mind, we're not taking Scala type, we're not taking Scala code and converting it to Verilog, right? What you're doing is you're writing Scala code that uses a library, and as it runs, the function calls are constructing hardware in the background. So right. the the union types in Scala may be usable as our hardware types, but generally we have to have a hardware representation of it. So now to answer your question a little further, this feature may allow you to then do that. So um, I actually don't have the code here. Uh, this is unfortunate. I only have the code locally. I can't believe I didn't push it. But a really common request in Chisel, let me open a SCACY just to show what I'm talking about here. A really common request in Chisel is you want to mux between tuples, right? So in Scala, people just like hide that. In Scala, people like to write something like, um, you know, val y z, right? Equals mux. So I'm select a b c d, right? It would be really nice if you could. These are these are Scala tuples. Right, kind of like the Scala union that you mentioned. And you would like to build a mux between them. But in Chisel, mux requires what's passed to it to be data, something that we understand. So what uh, data view lets you implement is it lets you implement a way to view this tuple as if it were a data. I see. And then I can now mux between them. And it would do the right thing. So that's that's another use case. So it, it's, it's not that the Scala union necessarily gets us there, but this feature now is an underlying feature that could make it maybe work, if that makes sense. With the data views, could you use like a mix in so the user could just write this Scala chiller code the way it makes sense to them and that like casting and invocation of the data view happen automatically? Is that possible for like a mix in under the hood? Yes. Um, so, you know, here in the test cases, I'm using all. Um, casts in some of these cases the casts will like this explicit cast will be necessary but for the case of um like this mux thing i you know you don't want to have to write this this would be really dumb <laughs> whatever right i'm not going to make you write that so i can provide an implicit conversion in an import that will see that you're using a tuple of two datas and say i know how to turn that into something i know as a hardware tuple and then it will just do it under the hood great great super neat on both sides too so the right this side is not that hard i could do this side a long time ago this side was the hard side how do you do it and make it connectable that's the trick that, so, that'll be cool that'll be really cool I'm pretty excited about this. I do think that this is a big, this is one of these, this is like a, a primitive that has a lot of applications. And so it's kind of a Swiss army knife. So I need to make sure the documentation is good and clear and use all of those tips that I just gave you all in doing so. Great, great. Yeah, no, we, we come across this where we kind of have these construction scenarios where we're building things that are scholarly classes or functions that aren't quite full on modules. And when we start passing around bundles and creating bundles, you know, how do you deal with this? You can either wrap the return in a wire and then assign to it. But I mean, keeping things in Scala land longer might be nicer in some cases. 
Yep. And that is, you know, data view allows you to view any thing as a data with a minor caveat and that that's all that'll all be documented. But you have to Ooh. tell Chisel like that your thing has data inside of it. Um, so if you're passing around a just a Scala class that has like three data fields in it, you have to tell Chisel about those three fields. But other than that, it can do all this viewing. It's pretty cool. So with this, could you perhaps easily make your own data types then? Yep. That's one of the goals. Cool. This is super cool. This is yeah. looking forward to no, it. I'm, I've been super excited about this for months and it finally works. Uh, so. Oh, I'm neat. Well, yeah, we're looking I haven't been working on it for months. I've been thinking about it for months and I finally started writing code recently. But. Yeah. yeah, well, that's, we're already we're already managing applications to this. That sounds very exciting. Yeah, cool. Uh, pretty any, any more questions from the audience? Okay, let's give Jack another round of applause. That was great. Thanks again for your, your talk. This was uh, very informative, and we learned a lot, especially uh, about these exciting features coming in Chisel. And so we're looking forward to those. <laughs> uh, thanks again. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot.